Welcome everyone to our actually webinar number two uh, in our Wyoming grant. Thanks to the CMP grant given by your Wyoming State Survey Agency and uh, the region of CMS that approved it. It is my honor, my name is Carmen Bowman to be getting to work with you. And on the webinar today, so far, I know we have four of our five homes that are in the part of the grant project that um, are getting uh, a little bit uh, of coaching in addition to these webinars. And I'll tell you who they are in a minute. This is part two. Let me kind of apologize, everyone. The Artifacts tool 2.0 that is hot off the press is much longer than the first one. The first one was, uh, it represented 69 culture change practices and get ready, the tool 2.0 represents 134, almost double, right? So it's hard to, to cover it all. And sometimes we're asked to talk about it and, and in a one hour webinar, I can talk about it, but it feels like so much is missing. And so it's always my desire to walk you through it. So the good news of these three webinars is we're walking through every item. The bad news is we can't park on any of them very long, but it's okay. I just wanna expose the whole tool to everybody first. And then as we move on in this year, uh, please feel free to weigh in and tell me which practices would you like more about, particularly you five homes that are in the project. They actually, their, their wishes are a little bit weight, weighted everyone, but, but I would love to hear from anyone, okay? So feel free. And so we did part one last time, it's recorded if you need to see it and it, it does a little bit more intro to the artifacts tool. And it also does the first section uh, which is resident directed life, which is wonderful. And now we move on to um, this webinar we're calling part two, and it will cover two more sections, two more of the five being well known, as well as home environment and accommodation of needs and preferences. So here we go, everybody. And not only do we have Wyoming on the webinar, we have Hawaii, welcome Mountain Pacific in Hawaii. Thank you for joining us. So the artifacts tool is meant to be all yours, everyone. It's we, we've, we've, we've better defined over the years what it is, and it really is a self-assessment tool. And so most of you probably have filled it out and good for you. Uh, we're hoping that not only was it, you know, a way to capture what practices are fully implemented, partially implemented and not at all, but hopefully it served as inspiration of some of the practices you want to have implemented. And I trust that it does that and just keep letting it do that for you, okay? And so, like I said, there's five sections and why don't we just turn our attention quickly to the second section called being well-known. So this section now really dives into, as you can guess, uh, what we would call typically how, you know, what, what we do in our assessment process and then how we get that on the care plan. And I want to welcome, we have residents, everyone. I'm at least aware of some residents from Granite who are listening. Welcome and thank you for coming. And if there are other residents listening, uh, we so welcome you. And we'd love to hear your feedback on anything that is said today. And so we're jumping to item number 40. The home collects information about residents' life stories and current interests and preferences. So sadly, in our institutional ways, many of our institutional assessments really haven't helped us to get to know people really good. And I think all of you may have stories. I have stories where we miss the mark. We don't find out things until later. And here's a great example, everyone. It's somewhat common. You know, if, if there's a person you serve living in your nursing home who you find on the floor a lot, but you're not convinced it was a fall. And then after somewhat digging discovery, talking more to the person, the family, you find out maybe they have some sort of practice where they like to sit on the floor. Some Asian cultures sit on the floor more. Some people like to get on their knees and pray. You know, there may be other reasons, right? And I just think it's a wonderful example that our assessment assessments are lacking if we don't learn some of that important detailed stuff before someone moves in. And then notice we're using the term life story here. Notice it's not the word social history. If you think about it, the title social history and kind of the logistics of boom, boom, boom. I'm sorry, but you know, sometimes it's just boom, boom, boom. Here's, here's the summary of your life. 
um, in our social history. And we just realize there's so much more to learn about a person. So we want to go beyond what's typically done, what's typically called the social history. You know, go for the details, everyone. Find out what makes this person very unique and go beyond demographics um, and find out whether they like to sit on the floor. <laughs> it sounds silly, but or what their daily pleasures are, or what a simple pleasure is, or what their pet peeves are. We could do so much more, and I got to move on. Now, another wonderful thing, if you're not doing it, and wonderful um, focus for all team members would be that you, as a team, attempt to understand a person's expressions and even their preferences of those who can't tell you with words. So if I spit out my green beans, what did I just tell you, everybody, right? And this is what your direct caregivers know about people. Uh, notice I didn't say frontline staff. We've, we've got to get rid of that language. Is anybody with me? Frontline, what does that imply, right? So we tend to say instead direct caregiver or hands-on caregivers. Uh, anyway, all of you know the people you serve very well. And this is a, an item, a practice, where you honor what you see and you honor what you know uh, don't ever dismiss what you know about people. It's very important. And you know, and notice that other item said current. You know what's current with people. Maybe family members sometimes know more about someone's past and less about current. And they're both very important, right? Then we move on that each residence care plan is of course specific to that individual and ready for this, reflects the residence goals. This is huge, everyone. And um, I failed to get it on my slide, I meant to, but I did a word search a few years ago with the new regulations from CMS. Can anyone guess how many times CMS uses this language, the residence goals? And it's singular, like each residence goals, right? And it is 153 times, everyone, in the new regs. And I'm excited about that. That is a culture change practice that landed in the regulations. We should be asking residents their goals. There's so much more I could say about that, but just know it's a best practice. It's in the regs, and now it's also considered an artifact of a change culture. Then we go on to something else huge. This is a whole webinar by itself. So first of all, have you heard of the Eden Alternative? It is a model of culture change. It is beautiful. I highly recommend it. It is simply a commitment to 10 principles of changing institutional culture. And they didn't stop there. The Eden Alternative has done a lot of good work in our culture change movement. And they also came up with what they call the seven domains of well being. And so here they come very fast, get ready <laughs> identity, connectedness, security, meaning, autonomy, growth, and joy. Now imagine that you are asking residents or residents listening, imagine someone starts to ask you. How would you like to grow at no matter what age you are and what brings you joy? And even better now, everybody, I'm, I'm still amazed at this. CMS actually added it. It is at tag 679, believe it or not, under intent. So if you need a little oomph to pick that one, go ahead and let a regulation give you some oomph. All right, the next practice, each person's care plan includes a plan for individualized movement and mobility per the person's capability and preference. So everyone beware, we don't just mean the typical rest restorative program or the fact that they get therapy. Please don't just write it off in your mind. Here's the real deal. When people, all of us, when we move more, we tend to be stronger. And when we're stronger, we tend to not fall as much. And even if we do fall, we tend to not get as many injuries when we are stronger. And we all know that when people get older and more frail and have more medical conditions, moving is harder. And so this is the point. How can we continue to help people move more no matter who they are and no matter what their capabilities are, even if it's passive range of motion, everyone. I have the joy of working with teams on, on unique practices to prevent falls. And this is one of them. And I love hearing nurses say, you know, Every time I go in and give a med, I'm gonna do range of motion with that person more often for my commitment to help them move more. And I invite team members to each make a commitment, something, anything, whether it's in a group 
or one-on-one -on -one in the room outside to help anyone or a group of people to move more. So the next practice, each resident's care plan includes preferences and accommodations for getting outside. This too is a better practice. It's something everybody wants. And so we're just encouraging you and calling it a, a standard, an artifact of a change culture is that you recognize most people's desire to go outside and you actually care plan it and you get to the details. When do they like to go? What do they like to do? Then each resident's care plan includes their preferred type of music and how they like to listen to it. Hopefully you've gotten the message. People's most favorite and familiar music stimulates the brain. It creates movement. It often creates, um, uh, it, it helps with our mood. Uh, peppy music helps us sort of wake up. There's so many things, right? Not enough time for me to list them. Therefore, music is so important we believe it belongs on everyone's care plan. Isn't that something? Then we have each care plan includes what brings meaning and purpose to that person, such as community service or volunteering, as well as their individual pursuits. And notice we didn't say activities. We're actually avoiding that word. That word just doesn't, doesn't describe well what, what really matters to people. So it's not about busy work and it's not about activities. It's about what brings someone meaning and purpose and getting that on the care plan so everybody knows it. Then we move into making sure each person's care plan also identifies what brings them a good night's sleep. What do they need for a good night's sleep? This is so much fun. I've had fun with many of you uh, on our calls talking about this. Uh, you could have fun together as a group at uh, inviting each other to answer the question, what do you need to have a good night's sleep? And it is really profound to hear all the different things. Uh, and then to challenge yourself, is that it? Sometimes people just say one thing, but if you ask for more, we all have <laughs> a good handful of things to, for a good night's sleep. And then the, the real meaning would be to find out what that is for each of the people you serve and to make sure it's on the care plan and make sure they're getting those things. Then of course, someone who may be at the end of their life, the same idea that preferences uh, regarding that time of life are also on a person's care plan. Then we move to care plan meetings, accommodate resident and family availability. So hopefully you all do this already. And that's an easy practice to stay fully implemented. Just, just challenge yourselves. Do you really have all families covered and all sorts of schedules covered? Hopefully you do. Uh, the next one, 51, a CNA who's familiar with this person attends and contributes to a resident's care plan meeting. Hopefully this is happening in your home. If it's not, this is another example of a culture change practice that actually became regulation. We're quite proud of it. It is now listed in CMS regs at 657. So if you didn't know that, there's another reason to do it. Uh, item 52 represents the practice that your care plan is shared in an understandable format. Hopefully you already do that. And that's an easy win. But in case you're not, it's, it's not only in the regs, but it's also you know, totally needed by each family, each person. Um, all team members who care for a resident provide input. Oh, so good. And also receive information regarding that resident's current care plan preferences and life story. So you get the idea here. Not only do you collect that information, which is one good practice, but now the team members caring for each individual also uh, find out that information and it informs their work and their care for that person. Uh, similarly, all team members who care for a resident make use of the ideally the resident's care plan goals and approaches every day, daily, as identified in the care plan. So this, this jazzes me. How about you, everybody? Part of the institutional uh, problems is maybe something good's on the care plan, but people don't know it. So making sure that the person is truly reflected in their care plan. And then everybody knows uh, what, what that person needs, loves, hates, <laughs> et cetera. And we make a point here that we're using the word approach instead of what word, everybody, what word do you hear all day long? And that word would be, drum roll, intervention. And if you think about the word intervention in your real life, what are you hearing about, sadly? you're hearing about a very tough situation regarding some sort of addiction for which a group a family has to do an intervention. 
and that word is kind of harsh, we realize. And, and I, I just think everyone, the word we meant and somehow didn't, didn't grab a hold of was approach because we would use a different approach for Mary than for Joe. So um, on the care plans, you don't have to call it intervention, get it changed, get your vendor, get PCC to change it, everybody. Uh, when you talk about anything, it doesn't have to be the word intervention. The word approach is really, I think, what we meant. And so looky there, we are done with section two called being well known. There happens to be 15 practices represented there. Notice I'm not really saying 15 points. It's not about points anymore. It's about practices and how many you have fully implemented, how many might be partially implemented and how many not at all, which hopefully will inspire you to implement them, right? Great. And I'm curious if anyone has questions, why don't I just take a breath and also um, take a drink before we move on to a whole other section. Does anyone have any feedback or questions about being well known? I'll just pause and you can either unmute yourself or type in the chat box. Being well known. I'd love to know what residents think if you have any residents with you, anybody. Anybody? Come on, everybody. It's more fun when you interact. You know that. <laughs> Carmen? Yes, Jesse. So here at South Lincoln, the residents said they feel like we do a fairly good job of getting to know them and bring it into their daily, the things that we do with them every day. Wonderful. Good. That's exciting. And Jesse, do they have any feedback on any of those items? Did they go, yes, to getting outside or anything like that? No, they didn't. Um, okay. We get outside as much as we can when it's nice in Wyoming, as we know winter lasts until June and we have two months of summer, but um, sure. they all participate in the activity planning. So we plan lots of things outside uh, based on what they want to do. Oh, sure. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you, Jesse. And thank you residents listening. How exciting to have you all. All right. Our next section, everyone is home and environment, or excuse me, home environment. And notice we're not saying home like. If you find yourself using that word, we would invite you to reconsider. Even the word, even though the word home like is in the regs, <laughs> there's a lot of words in the regs that are outdated and institutional, facility being one, interventions being a big one. And here we come with home like. Now it was meant well, right? When these regs were written back in the 90s, 80s, 90s, home like was meant well. And, and we don't mean to downplay the people that did the hard work, but we've just realized we don't want home like, we want home. And then also this section incorporates accommodation of needs and preferences. So it's a big section and here we go. And it starts with kind of a big deal in the culture change movement. And that is whether or not residents live in what we're calling small group living areas. And what we mean is a neighborhood or a household or a small house or a greenhouse, which of which you have some in, in Sheridan. And, and what that means is there's a full kitchen, dining area and living room. Like this is like a house, everybody. And meals are made there. And um, we go into the size and everything. And I know most of you don't have it and it's okay, but it is a culture change practice that we're all proud of. And I bet you're not surprised to hear that COVID fared better in these smaller um, household environments with the same people coming and going. And um, we're hoping that that maybe makes an impact coming out of the pandemic. And I have some wonderful photos to show you. This is the front door of a household in Manhattan, Kansas at Metal Arc Hills. And they made a big deal that there would be a front door to this house. Uh, because that's normal. They even called it the sanctity of the household. You would ring the bell at my house. I would ring the bell at yours. There's a doorbell. And if you ever wanted to go visit here, everybody, you can't just have a tour. The residents have decided that they don't want to be toured and looked at, but you can come and pay a visit like you normally would in a home, have a meal or come to an event and spend time with them if you want to learn what it's like to live in a household. Isn't that something? And then uh, this is a picture. Uh, next, we have the practice that all residents, ready, live in private rooms. And I'll tell you what, these households that have been uh, remodeled 
um, they always have private rooms. And we all know how much most people want that. I'll tell you everyone that even if you don't ever get to remodel, uh, in Colorado, there was a trend for a while where a shared room, they purposely created it to be a one person room. So now imagine that shared room is one room. <laughs> it has a whole different feel moving in because you get all the space. And research actually shows that your private rooms tend to remain full, whereas shared rooms tend to remain, you know, part of it empty. It's research and I could, I could guide you to the, to the study. So hopefully we'll all move in that direction, won't we? All right, then. Now, if you don't have private rooms, here's kind of the next best thing. Residents live in either private rooms or privacy enhanced shared rooms where residents living space is separated by a partial wall, <laughs> which is not just a privacy curtain. Oh, you know what we call it? A so-called privacy curtain. Uh, again, I don't mean to be so negative, but is it really a privacy curtain? <laughs> so here's a great picture. There still is the curtain because that to keep separating the two people if necessary, but you see the wall and that was built into uh, an existing nursing home. Uh, I even have some more, nope, sorry. I do have other pictures if anyone ever wants to see them and they are done in a typical nursing home room where there's only one window and they have built these walls in between. Some homes have made the wall to be removable. So if someone wants it, great. If they don't, if a couple wants to share the room, great, isn't that neat? And so privacy enhanced shared rooms have a partial wall between two sides of a shared room, typically floor to ceiling. Sometimes it's removable for choice purposes and it gives better privacy than a curtain. And typically the, both people still share the bathroom. Okay, moving on, the next culture change practice uh, reflected at 58 here. The home has no nurses stations. Team members work in some sort of areas that are accessible to residents and families. So the idea of not offices where staff go and now you can't find them. I mean, we just heard that that sometimes has been what happens next. That's certainly not the goal here. In fact, this is an early culture change home and Sister Pauline here was an early pioneer of the Pioneer Network and the culture change movement. And she always made the point to say, notice it's like a living room and we want team members to be here, to be present, to live, you know, to the idea of living together, being together, not off somewhere else. And uh, nowadays with electrical charts, we don't have to worry electronics so much about where to put the charts, but they were an early home to hide all the medical looking things like resident records just behind a cupboard door. All right, the next practice is that you have eliminated or you never even use med carts. Here's an example of what a home did in Minnesota. They built purposely medication locked drawers into this cabinetry that went into every resident room in this household model um, and a private room. And so, uh, you can see meds being given and, uh, and a locked mechanism for locking the meds. All right, number 60, all residents, whether they stand or sit, can see themselves in a mirror at the sink. And so there's different ways to do this. Here's one example. Uh, you could use the tilt mirrors. You could use a regular mirror. Just you could make sure mirrors are down as far as they can go. You can use a, a lip full length mirror if you have the space. Um, yeah, it can be however it works in your building. And then 61, seated residents can comfortably reach their sinks. Sadly, have you ever seen a person trying to brush their teeth, <laughs> but they're so short and little, they can't really even see the sink. And so we found at the same home in, in New York that there are sinks such as this one apparently that are movable. You could actually adjust the sink up and down and the PVC piping can, can be changed to come with it. Wow. Each resident's toiletries are within reach. You know, that tells you why in the world would we add that to the artifacts tool? Sadly, it tells you that that's just not always the case. So very, very important that when a resident puts their toothpaste down somewhere or in a drawer that they put it where they want it and we don't disturb it. 
Okay, closets have movable rods that are set to different heights depending on the resident's preferences and needs. So here's an example of some rods at different heights. Uh, it's not that hard really to put in a rod that's lower. Maybe, maybe in some cases you can have some clothes on to a top rod, some on a lower. Um, maybe there's more shelving with the lower. It just, you be creative, see what your resident's needs are. Then we move on to residents are welcome to decorate their walls according to their preferences with, with really anything we meant. But if, if nails are a problem, you know, thankfully nowadays we have all sorts of different kinds of hooks and strips and the command strip. Uh, but we really are making a point here. I hope this doesn't go on in any of your homes anymore, but there used to be a day where res dear residents were told you can only have four nail holes in the wall. <laughs> And we just can't let that be, can we? They pay a lot of money for that typically half a room. And we want to just spread the idea that when residents decorate as they wish, when you encourage them to bring more things that reflect who they are, you get to know them better. They are more well known. We just went through all that. And here's a great example of a home that, that was proud to do this and a woman that really took them up on it. And I just want to tell you a couple things. This is um, many years ago the administrator uh, was doing so many amazing things. And you see the older style wallpaper up on the top. They actually gave residents the choice of like different color schemes. So when you moved in, you could look at the different color schemes and you could have the wallpaper, the paint and the blinds changed if you wanted. And, you know, he got a lot of questions like, oh my goodness, was that expensive? And he said, nope, <laughs> because barely anybody did it that what they saw was nice and it was fine with most people. And I just marvel at that, you know, they were given choice, but didn't even need it. It's kind of interesting. Uh, then he also invited people to bring their own uh, furniture as well as bedding. And he committed to using the sprays and the dips if necessary to make something flame retardant. And you have to keep track of how many times something is washed and you have to use the flame retardant dip again after so many washes. And he was very proud to do that. And I was really impressed with that. This is the same room, everybody. Like I, I get excited about this because wow, in a small space, this woman has helped us get to know her and she is seeing things that mean things to her. I, I think this might be me <laughs> someday. And look at how well she's supported um, her TV, her fan, her plant, her fish, so much decor, her clock, uh, her refrigerator. And then I want you to notice there is something medical in this picture. Can you see it? And it's in front of the fridge. It's a nebulizer machine. And every time I see this photo, I'm, I remember a memory early in the culture change movement, a leader, Susan Masorsky would say, so much of an institutional room only says what's wrong with a person. So imagine an empty room and all you really see is the nebulizer, right? Whereas when rooms say who you are, you, you oftentimes don't even see the medical stuff. And this, this room, you know, years later reflected what she taught us in the early days of changed culture of the movement. Okay, 65, uh, your home would make available an extra lighting source in the residence room if requested. This is a very easy one. So maybe a lamp or a floor lamp and hope they already do that. Light, lighting throughout resident use areas is sufficient according to the resident. So there's a lot in this short sentence. First of all, lighting in nursing homes um, has been determined to be very poor, very dark. Studies have shown it. We've, we've like CMS has paid money for people to research this kind of thing. And one study showed that the darkness in 40 nursing homes averaged blindness. <laughs> On a light meter, it averaged one. And a light meter is zero to 10. So uh, just know that in just thinking in general, probably your nursing home is too dark. Let's just start with, with average research. So now to cre create more lighting, uh, notice we said in resident use areas. So we just had to be clear that, and, and to be honest, <laughs> I think we could have actually said in staff use areas too. What do you think? People who work in nursing homes, 
uh, dark darkness is not great for for doing good work and good care and treatments and that kind of thing, painting. And then uh, who gets to say it's sufficient? You know, residents are the focal point here, but you could certainly expand it to anyone working there as well. And I, I would really recommend you dig into it. Take take some tours through the building. Look through the eyes of residents. Ask residents. Ask staff really go after lighting. Uh, it's so good, it's so important, and it's so helpful. It even helps our mood, right? Lighting throughout, uh, excuse me, number 67, the home has minimized glare from unshielded windows and shiny floors. So hopefully you don't have shiny floors anymore. To be honest, it's kind of a thing of the past, and you can get products that don't, um, don't create shine. If you didn't know that, that's a simple thing to do. And probably most of your windows have some sort of drapery or blinds, but if they don't, the idea here is that you can control glare. You can get rid of glare for people. All right, some fun, fun ideas here. Check this out. Institutional over the door call lights have been replaced with something else, alternatives such as a porch light. And this is just one of our favorite photos. Uh, we need you to know everyone. This is a very old nursing home in Denver. The administrator would talk about how her maintenance guys were very creative and they worked with cinder block, you know, the good old cement blocks. And they were able to rewire the hospital light call lights that were above the door and brought them over to the side and put in porch lights. And now look at the difference in the feel. It is not institutional. And of course, when a person would hit their call light, it would simply turn on the porch light and everyone in the place realized the porch light meant they were asking for assistance. So good. And then you can also see they borrowed the doorbell idea and they also put in mailboxes. So that's a mailbox for the two people that live in that room. And you'll see that again coming up here. So a, another uh, artifact would be the home has a silent call light system or you've turned off the audible feature of your call light system. And I'm so happy to tell you that it's always been in the regs and it remains in the regs that you can double check me because you're probably going to want to that you can have audible or visual call light and it just saddens me it's too bad. We never ever just chose as a whole field to go with the uh, visual only, we would have had a lot less noise. And studies show that noise actually contributes to falls. So we have a lot of noise, everybody. And it's fun to go after these links to falls and watch falls come down. I'm, I have the privilege of working with lots of teams and I can almost guarantee you start to go after some of this stuff, you will see your falls come down. In fact, a home in Florida has had one home had only one fall one month, and that same home has hovered around three and four. And then another big win lately is one home had 44 falls in July when right before we started. And by March, they had six falls. Isn't that exciting? And they're doing some of the things like this. So Number 70, team members communicate with each other without overhead paging. So now we're going after the noise of the overhead paging. I'd love to know from all of you, do you use overhead paging or not? And you know, if you are and you wonder how does everyone get their message, just know that most homes around the country do not use overhead paging anymore. And so there you go. And now start to brainstorm. You can guess how they do it, <laughs> you know? They use their cell phones, they use texting, they use paper, they leave messages, you know, they use pagers, radios. We all know the different venues that can be used, right? And you just pick one, what matches your team. Okay, now we're at 71, looky there. Resident rooms have mailboxes at the room entry or you have a central mail location. So it's such a simple thing to add to your environment to create home. Your home supports the right of residents to have a refrigerator in their room. That should be a non-issue, I hope. Uh, residents and families have easy access to microwaves and also assistance if they need it. You know, we really wanted to say they have the right to have a microwave in their room. And I want you to be aware of that. How many of you are gonna want a microwave in your room? 
And how about the next one? Residents and families have easy access to coffee makers and the assistance again, if needed. We really wanted to stay in the room. And sadly, it gets a little tricky, but I just want you to be aware of that. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could support people to really have what they want in their rooms? And so keep getting as close to that as possible. How many of you love coffee in the morning? And how are you or I gonna get our coffee right away in the morning? And how is the team going to help us get our coffee and know what kind we like and how much, et cetera? It's, it's so good, everyone. If you perfect it now, you'll be famous and baby boomers will want to live in your nursing home. All right, 75, in dining rooms, meals are not eaten on trays. Food is removed from any tray used for transport. I hope this is not happening in Wyoming, but I do not know. Um, sadly, <laughs> in some of the Zoom meetings, I have actually seen the horseshoe tables, which by the way, Wyoming, they're, they're antiquated. I haven't seen them for decades and I was shocked to see them. And so maybe food is still being served on trays as well, but both of those items are really artifacts of an institution. And so instead, uh, well, also in addition, I should say, food is served on normal plateware, normal china, normal glassware, normal silverware. And of course the disposable is just used on occasion, maybe like picnics. And so we're really going after real glassware, everyone, real china, real plates, uh, not plastic. Coffee doesn't taste good in a plastic coffee cup. Water doesn't taste good in a plastic uh, water glass, right? And so that's an artifact now. Each dining room table has condiments such as salt and pepper shakers. Plus, notice here someone has, uh, I believe, malt vinegar and some look, looks like maybe garlic salt to me. And I want to sit there, by the way, <laughs> besides the salt and pepper shakers. Oh, it's so good. All right. How about Wi Fi, everybody? Available to residents and visitors throughout resident use areas at no additional charge. And your passwords are easily accessible or displayed if you even have any and team members know how to help. Sadly, we're hearing stories across the country that you know, staff don't know the password that you gotta have to get into Wi-Fi and that's not very welcoming. We all have been there before now, right? And hopefully you don't even need a password, that'd be even better. Uh, sufficient outlets, do you all have sufficient outlets in resident rooms? So here they come with their tablets and their laptops and everything else. Could you live in a typical nursing home room and would there be sufficient outlets? It's, it's exciting, it's coming and homes that are on top of it, here's what they do. They just know we gotta get going on this. And I've met administrators that advise their maintenance team to just go room by room. You just go, just start and go and start and keep going until we have every room covered. Something else to consider everyone is outlets higher you know, imagine probably someone in a wheelchair instead of low to the ground. All right, and then we were just talking about outdoors a little bit. Uh, here's an item. The home provides accessible outdoor space for resident use at times of their choice. Assistance is provided um, accessing the space. And by the way, if you have automatic doors, then people barely need assistance. That's really the key. Um, and the next item there is depicted here in the picture. The home has its own outdoor walking and wheeling path that is actually not a city sidewalk. And this is a home in Fort Collins and this is their courtyard with a path for walking that is not a sidewalk. And that's kind of the idea. All right, then we're at 82, except for emergencies, the overhead paging system has been turned off. Uh, so again, not using overhead paging, except maybe for emergencies. And we included not using, um, not making announcements over the phones, which have the speaker capability. It might be tempting to switch or maybe wean yourself off, which is fine. But again, the idea is not audible, all this audible announcement. Okay, 83, residents and families have easy access to a washer and a dryer. Uh, and team members, staff members assist residents if necessary. This is what culture changing homes have done, everyone. L let's just be honest, in the household model or the small house model, um, it's pretty natural, right? That a house would have a washer and a dryer. So that's really where we learned it, but we brought it to the tool for all nursing homes because smart nursing homes started to realize, hey, 
we could find a place to have a household washer and a dryer. And I would just recommend that you start to think about, could it be on each, whatever you got, each um, neighborhood, ideally, so that more and more residents, if they can, and family members could go use them. And, and I just love how we don't need to have family members schlepping dirty clothes home and schlepping the clean back, you know? Think about how much money people spend to live in a nursing home. And there's all that schlepping. And then think about what could be happening when families are maybe helping the laundry to be done, but they don't have to leave. And now they're there longer. Oh, and even coming out of the pandemic, won't that be precious that they spend more time and they do more normal things together. They live life together better than a visit, by the way. I could say more about that if you want to hear, let me know. For homes without full bathrooms, residents are escorted to bathing areas, either fully dressed or in a robe and flippers per their preference. So thankfully we have more and more uh, rooms with their own showers and, and that's exciting. Um, but we all know that's not every room. And so making sure people are being helped to that spot down the hall in a very dignified way per their preference. In the bathing areas, each resident has privacy. So the idea of even a Lene type of screen, is that how you say it, I think? Uh, just really affording as much privacy as you possibly can for people. Okay, and then next we have uh, no locked living areas, everybody. Yeah, we mean that. So a locked living area, yeah, we mean secured memory care unit or secured memory care neighborhood. Did you know that these are now being viewed in our movement as, quote, the hidden restraint? And the homes that have unlocked them find that people living in those areas, I, I won't say units, that's an institutional word, but people living in a locked neighborhood have a lot of what we call behaviors, which is unfair to them because how many of you would have a behavior, <laughs> a negative behavior if you were locked up? I think I would, how about you? And so I just need you to start hearing that and homes are doing it and it's now part of the artifacts tool as well. Okay, based on resident preference, residents who use wheelchairs are seated actually in regular chairs during the dining uh, meal times. And I love this picture. I once had this home on my uh, monthly webinar talk show and I, I so appreciate, do you see that there is a chair at every space at those tables. That's the, the point. And so homes like this that have dedicated um, themselves to getting residents out of wheelchairs, they pride themselves now in calling, they don't call it a wheelchair, they call it a transfer chair. And if you ever wanted to move in that direction, the language ends up helping you. You're making a point that we're just gonna transfer people with this chair with the wheels because we're gonna help people to sit on, on real chairs uh, as much as possible. Good stuff, huh? Prior to or during the move-in process, who can see what words we're avoiding there? And when changes occur, resident family is notified of all amenities and opportunities available. So <laughs> we mean everything, like committees you can serve on, the resident council, any volunteer options, which hopefully you have more and more of, uh, where the computer center is, where they can get a massage, you know, where the door is to the outside that's automatic and they don't need help, you know, all these good things. And then notice instead of saying um, admission, how many of you were admitted to the house you live in? How many of you were discharged from the last house you live in? What's normal, people move in and move out. And yes, some people just come for a stay and they're not moving in. But remember, it's first and foremost a home for majority of usually people that live there. It's a home for them and they are residents who live there and the people who come and go don't move in, they're not residents, uh, but it's still a home. You see, it's people live in homes. They don't live in facilities and they don't live in centers. And how many of us go to someone else's home to stay? And many places have used the language of guests that you have people who live there and you have rehab guests perhaps. Um, another wonderful thing, everyone, instead of being the new admit, if you stop the language of admittance and admits and admission, they become um, not only the new resident, but some other neat language that some homes, some
people who live in these nursing homes have decided to call themselves neighbors. And I know Granite, you're listening and you all decided to do that recently. Congratulations. In parts of Colorado, you will hear staff team members refer to the neighbors. Well, our neighbors chose this and our neighbors chose that. And that's the language of the people who live here, the residents. Um, you don't have to do that, but it might be fun to think about and talk about. Truly, I think the people who live there are neighbors to one another. And then the language starts to flow. If you talk more about home and community and people who live there and moving in and moving out and neighbors and neighborhoods, you see, it's so good. It starts to match and go together. Okay, this is a good one. In a home with corridors, <laughs> I think you all have corridors, hallways, Seating areas affixed to the floor as permitted by Life Safety Code are available. Believe it or not, Life Safety Code 2012 um, brought about some culture change items. And one of them is this, that you can have chairs in the hallway. There's a few stipulations. If you wanna know more later, I can tell you. To provide safe travel between beds and bathrooms, nightlights are used in resident rooms, a really good practice to help prevent falls. Chair, bed, floor, and doorway audible alarms are not used. Hallelujah. Uh, the home does not use bibs or clothing protectors or shirt protectors, no matter what you call them. Linen or paper napkins are used instead. It's just the artifact of a changed culture. Noise at night is minimized to enhance resident sleep. So that can be noise in the hallway from carts and ice machines and people talking, uh, whatever the noises might be, including alarms. And so the, the total for this section just happens to end up being 39, not any magical number or anything. Um, and I wanna show you, here's a sample of what it looks like at the very end of the artifacts tool. You see each of the five sections, it reminds you how many total there are, and then you would fill in your fully and partially and not a current practice. And then your total again should be thir the same, 39 and 39. Uh, 15 and 15, and we just did again, 39 <clears throat> and 39. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and we'll get to those other sections next month. And then besides seeing the numbers, we also guide you to do percentages just out of curiosity. And these are the numbers you could watch um, change in time at using this tool. And so remember, it's an, it's an internal self-assessment and implementation tool. And we recommend you use it at the beginning of any kind of culture change journey or effort you're gonna embark on, and then use it periodically, probably annually makes a lot of sense. You wouldn't necessarily have to do it more often. Uh, and then you wanna watch for ideas, you know, um, you wanna create goals in some cases, you wanna show improvement in your tallies, you know, it's progress, it's measurement, hopefully it serves you well. You can also use this tool to ferret out differences. So maybe administration thinks, well, yeah, we do that, but direct caregivers and residents go, no, you don't. And so that's really a good reason to also go through it as a group. Uh, hopefully again, it inspires and educates you what you could do um, and just be creative, everybody. Have fun, talk a lot, think about these things. Um, you know, go fast if you want. Don't worry about it if you can't, <laughs> it's your journey. And whenever there was an asterisk on the slide, it came from what we're now calling a guidance tool. So if you download the artifacts tool, make sure you also get the guidance tool. And artifacts has its own website again at the Piner Network website, if you want to go get all that I'm talking about. And then there's even more, we created um, links to any resource we ha have ever known about, uh, whether it's free or cost money, you know, from videos to clips to um, articles to books, it's all there. And uh, go after it. And then we also put together some free videos that go into more detail if you're interested in any of those. And then I just want to um, do a shout out for our homes around your state, Wyoming. Powell Valley, uh, Star Valley, Link, South Lincoln, and Granite, and oops, I gotta change that, uh, Polaris, sorry, <laughs> and I will. And then I thought it'd be fun for everyone listening to hear what they're doing. This is so exciting. So Star Valley is going after buffet dining, 
individualizing birthday celebrations and finding more ways for residents to volunteer. Powell Valley is going after a welcome committee doing memorials per person instead of in a group when someone passes away and they're going after um, porch lights, everybody. South Lincoln is, is turning their attention to making meals more friendly and maybe getting linen napkin uh, menus and more choice and a welcome wagon with a buddy system to welcome people, particularly in their first week. Granite, you all are looking at rituals, recognizing that someone has passed away and honoring that person music preferences, and they're really going to town with anything they can think of to highlight more music in their home, everybody, uh, like talent shows and a band and um, karaoke is so much fun. And uh, they are also going to potentially hire a massage therapist, everyone, to provide massage therapy. Brilliant. And then Polaris, uh, you guys are going after figuring out how to honor sleep. You're starting to talk to residents and giving choice and asking for their preference. Do they want to be woken up during the middle of the night or not? That's really important. And what do they need for a good night's sleep? And what kind of noise is there at night? They're also going after the welcome committee. They're having fun just talking about it. How many of you ever were touched with the kind of an idea of a welcome wagon in your community growing up? Your parents, your grandparents, anybody talk about it? And then what was it like for real when you moved in here, wherever that might be, everybody. And, you know, good experiences, bad experience and learning from that. And then what, what would be ideal when people move in? And then they're also wanting to make dining friendly. You kind of use the same language, both of you uh, that are looking at that. And they ended up deciding to try a dessert cart. <laughs> Isn't that great? So congratulations, all five of you in this project. Uh, and I wanna open it up. I, I really wanna hear from you all. So um, let's see, uh, if you want a handout, everyone, let me just tell you the process. Since I don't have every email in Wyoming, we're always going through Jill Holt of the Wyoming uh, Mountain Pacific. So watch, <coughs> <coughs> terrible timing, so sorry. Watch for emails from Jill Holt. She always will send the link and also the handout. So she did send the handout a few days ago. If you can maybe uh, search your email, but anyone, you're welcome to um, get a hold of me if you need anything. So somebody share something. Granite, South Lincoln, um, anyone listening? Life Care of Casper. Yeah, go ahead. So I was just going to say that I love the idea of not having a locked unit. I think like that is intriguing to me. Um, we didn't pick that one for our culture change, but I love that idea. And who's talking? Is that Courtney? It is Courtney. Yeah. Yeah. yeah good for you, Courtney. It's, and you know what? I'm, I'm curious from my four homes on the line, are any of you going to only do three practices? <laughs> so no, we're not, we have more things going, but that's not, I mean, that would be a really big one for us definitely to unlock the memory care. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Courtney, I'd be, I'd be honored to talk, help talk your team through it. Uh, there's no rush. It takes time to think it through, talk it through, have a plan. But if you want to turn our calls into looking at that, I'd be honored. I think it's so important. So thank you, Courtney, for just sharing that. And then, oh, wow, Brittany Hull. Um, in the chat box, everyone, Courtney, you might want to call Life Care of Casper. Brittany Hall is saying, we did away with our locked unit and it has been wonderful. Hey, Brittany, could you get on and talk? Tell us a little bit about that. I, you just have to unmute yourself, please. Or uh, Larissa or, uh, Brit yeah, Brittany or Larissa, could you speak to that? Go ahead. I shouldn't be able to talk. It shows you unmuted, guys. Shucks. I don't know why. Maybe you guys could type something in the chat box. But anyway, um, I want to thank Life Care because I remember Life Care doing this years ago in Colorado. I believe it must be a Life Care trend 
And so maybe life care becomes a resource for all of us, everybody. And maybe if you want a, a session on it, we could uh, get those guys on the webinar and help teach us. That'd be wonderful. All right. Hey, Brenda. Hey, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, they don't have a microphone. It's okay, guys. Thank you. Yep, go ahead. South Lincoln and Star Valley and uh, Polaris. I'm just picking on you guys. Any feedback on anything? I have this, Go ahead. <laughs> this is Star Valley. Um, that porch light idea, I think, is amazing. And I'm kind of going to um, really push for that. I think that because for one, the sound of those call lights is awful. Yeah. And I think it just looks better to do that. That is such a neat idea. I just love it. I really Go do. For it. Go for it, guys. Why not? And, I, and I'm not looking for commitments here. I'm just looking for feedback. So thank you. Uh, that was Pam, right? And now- oh, Actually, that was Tony. Oh, sorry, and, Tony. And That's this, all right. And this is Pam. And I am going to really work on mailboxes outside the rooms. And I love those fancy numbers above them and just a welcome sign on the outside. I'm thinking I'm going to try to talk them into letting them choose a door color and, and, and kind of paint it like it looks like an outside door. Yeah, have it actually look like a porch instead of a yeah. new hallway. Do it. And, and guys, I'm like you. I get really excited. Um, but always remember to go to the people who live there, right? And help them get excited and see what yeah. they say, right? It'll be so good. What would you think of that, Carol? Well, making your... <laughs> essential but i think it's nice <laughs> i think that's carol that's our carol not yeah. essential but it would be fine thank you carol yeah. <laughs> i love it okay how about brenda and team and just any feedback thoughts if not it's okay and maybe they're not there and do i need to do anything sorry guys uh, asked to unmute. You should be able to now, Brenda. I said they were going crazy over here about the porch lights too. <laughs> I love it. Go crazy, guys. Come on. We need more crazy. All right. Let's do it, everybody. More porch lights. Well, I think we're at time. Any questions from anybody? Mahalo, says Mark from Hawaii. Isn't that fun, everyone? He says, thanks. And everyone, uh, Life Care of Casper is more than willing to talk about it on, on a webinar. And <laughs> they'll use a different computer they can talk over. That's great. So let me just all remind you, the next free training, uh, we're doing the last Friday of every month. So June 25th, please block it out on your calendar. Please get more people to come. There's nothing wrong with how many come. But I'll tell you what, it's, it's a phenomenon. It's a truth that the more people hear this stuff, the more get excited and the more people want to make mailboxes and they'll help you <laughs> and they'll help you get the call lights changed over, you see? And so just keep getting more residents, more families. See if you can get families. Share the link, guys. Everyone's invited, okay? Plus, remember, this is recorded and we'll end it now and I'll be sending the link as soon as it's available, okay? And I just want to thank all of you so much whether you're in the five or not. Uh, the same link is not used, everybody. It'll be a new link each time um, I have that question, but thanks for asking. Just keep watching for info from Jill Holt. You could also give me your, your email and I could keep my own email list and we could do both too. All right, well, thank you, Wyoming. Thank you, everyone. Keep up the great work and we'll close the webinar for now. Take care.